This is the second half of our conversation with Michael Andre Driussi about our first Severian theory. If you've gotten to this episode first, you want to go back to the one right before it. It's just kind of how your app puts these things in order, but you'll get the full story there. The another thing I like about this theory at a literary level, it's a clap back to Peter Wright. Remember, mm-hmm. Peter, uh, Peter Wright argued that Severian is a puppet. He's manipulated by the heroes mm-hmm. from start to finish. This explanation says, no, Severian is a puppet, but he's a puppet of Severian and Severian alone. Remember, the, re- the literal meaning of the term autark, self-ruled. Yeah. Autark, Severian the lame, is ruled by himself. And I really love that. Well, and puppetry gets a little tricky when when you're optimizing your own self in in a loving way. He is being the father to his younger yeah. self. And that's when we use the short story, you know, The God and His Man, which offers the similar thing in a short story, but shows that even the manipulated puppet, the man, when he recognizes, wait, there's a problem with this God, he turns against it and just kills it outright. Mm. Um, so it's, there's a there's that tension there, and that's what makes the God and his man such a wild opposite or something. Just on that point, too, that I think is perfect, is one question that always comes up when people are trying to take Book of the New Sun and be like, what does it mean? Or what is Wolf trying to say? The issue of sort of free will versus determinism always comes up, especially when you're thinking of, you know, is Severian in control of what's going on here or is he being manipulated by other forces? And what's great about this theory is this has it both ways. It's both determined. I mean, he's just like you said about a puppet is that it really is able to take both those sides and, and sort of show how there's not, Mm -hmm. there's maybe not a contradiction there. And, and what we're saying is that if, if he were to be treated as a puppet, as an object, and just rudely used, mm-hmm. he would resist. So it has to be, to be through all these soft approaches, from the graven images, to the mm-hmm. stories, to encountering people and seeing uh, these different mm-hmm. perversions and, and sins. And so it's, he's being taught through examples rather than just listen to me and do you know what i mean it's a it's a very diffuse but dare i say purpose driven Mm -hmm. kind of thing well what about i think now that i see your understanding of the god and his man i get a better understanding of why you think the way you do about the way that the first severian and the second severian relate to each other And it makes me think, actually, it's actually, I actually do see it buttressed in the tale of the student and his son, where the, the story ends with the, the student dying, falling into the sea. Right. But, but now, like what we're saying, now we can also understand that the first Severian is also being rewritten by his actions on the second Severian. So I see, yeah, I, I do see that, but I'm, I'm. And now that I see, you know, some textual support for it, I, I'm I'm doubting in myself, but I'm still, I'm still not convinced of that uh, that he's overwritten, because that's that's kind of not the way time seems to work in this universe. Uh, first of all, Severian remembers the life of the other Severian. He is constantly, as uh, Craig said at one point, he's constantly stretched. His soul is stretched between two timelines. This is only possible if that other Severian actually exists rather than essentially being the same Severian and being constantly overwritten. And then I think of Master Ash's tower, where even though the first Severian has achieved the new sun, Master Ash can still exist in a potential alternate future where Earth is a frozen wasteland. Also, not only can alternate futures exist, but also alternate pasts, because Ash says that Severian is a ghost of a figure from his past. So a, an alternate past that can, uh, that will actually lead to a new sun can also exist. He says that he can only enter Severian's time without disappearing if there's a good possibility of his future existing in that timeline, of him existing in that timeline. 
the a one where Earth is a frozen wasteland, a good likelihood of that future existing. Severian can enter Ash's time because he still has the possibility of making choices to allow it to occur. Right. Ash's house is like at an intersection of Severian's right. timeline and Ash's as they branch shortly after that moment. Right. So Severian wanders the corridors of time, plural, not the corridor of time. It seems to me that it's entirely possible for the first Severian to continue to exist. Well, well with, alongside I think, the first one, okay, the second but Severian. I think I think he when I say he's being rewritten, I think he's being I want to be clear, he's being rewritten in the same way that our second Severian is being rewritten. That is to say, from one sentence to the next, there's a little change. Mm -hmm. and, and yet he still goes on. I mean, this is that you still have weird weird fragments that now become dreams or half remembered little things, but I, I do think they're not in parallel timelines. They're on the same timeline. Mm -hmm. And so anything he does to his 22-year-old self then becomes what happened to his 22-year-old self. Huh. Okay. Well, you you might be right. Like I say, I can see that there is some textual weight to what you're saying. But I'm going to offer this other alternate theory. The first Severian walks the corridors of time and chooses the earliest moment where he, the Severian who achieves the new sun, exists. And he guides that timeline up to its birth and after in order to, from his perspective, improve the timeline. And Wolf, he doesn't care as the author about how many Severians there are at the moment the second Severian dies. The first Severian is a, it's like a space-time constant in the life of the second Severian the Severian of the Book of the New Sun. This story is told from the point of view of Second Severian, so it doesn't matter what happens beyond the consciousness of Second Severian. There's no right. point in Second Severian's life when the first Severian isn't there tinkering with his life. Perhaps even on Second Severian's deathbed, First Severian is there manipulating himself. I, I think that is why Wolf was so reticent to accept a blurb at the end of Citadel of the Autark, that Severian sailed beyond the stars and achieved the new sun. This is a, a cyclic, eternal setting. And a blurb like that just makes the story, you know, unidirectional arc, time arc. Well, what's important is that, at least from Severian's perspective, the first Severian always exists. The one only other thing I wanted to ask about was Mal Rubius and Triskel. And, um... Oh, I have got something for that. <laughs> You're supposed to be quiet now. You're supposed no, to be but I have something. <laughs> <laughs> They're obviously coming from whoever it is that's watching and manipulating Severian. So on this account, would they be sent by first Severian to talk to second Severian? Mm. Yes, it's, I think so. I think, well, first of all, we we trace them back to the, the second time ship, right? That's pretty clear that they're, they're coming from that the time ship that looks like a normal boat as opposed to the time ship that looks like a flying saucer. It's a normal boat that could just sit there on the on the river over there by the uh, Citadel Hill and nobody would give it a second look. So once we understand that, it seems to be from that one, and then we think, well, so that boat, that second time ship as a boat could be on the river at any time during Severian's life and nobody would give it a second glance. And then it seems like, well, so it was probably there when Severian had his little near drowning thing. Because that's the thing is you think, well, why? I guess that I think that's what Craig's question is. Why? Why Malrubius and why mm -hmm. the dog? And it's my thinking is that they put him, they put the second Severian into a near-death situation in order to scan him and see what sort of things he's thinking and what kind of figures are coming to his mind. And then they can use those. And that's why mm. they saw, well, they at that point, they probably just saw there was no dog yet. That's when they picked up Malrubius. And then later on, they picked up the dog so that he could be the ambassador of the animals and the non mm. the non-human and all that. I have a different idea. 
Well, one thing I, I love about this reading, this understanding is I feel like that for the last 15 years, the reading of the, of the book of the new sun has gotten a bit stale. I mean, not to say that people are enjoying it, but you know, in those early days of the earth list, the, you know, everyone was, was trying to crack that book and they, th- everyone had this hope of doing so. And it just feels like around 2006, 2005, people began to get a feeling that this book was in plot gridlock. You had all of these different possible motivations. You had all these different theories, but it just didn't feel like there were enough pieces on the table. But, you know, with this, suddenly you have like, like this little parking lot, the, the whole, the, all of the gridlock is just cleared up. And, and so I, I want to show the ways in which I, this really, really affected me. Uh, for instance, all right, let's talk about Severian's memory. Okay. Severian says his memory is incorruptible. He says he can even remember when he remembered something differently. Does he have eidetic memory? Do we think he did or not? Or does he only think he does? Yeah, it's it's tricky, obviously. I think he does. I think he always had eidetic memory. What he does is he he remembers what's happened to the first Severian, and he remembers his own life, and it's very confusing. It, he says he's insane. Well, this this is this explains it. The yeah. the dro the Drota Rosha error in yep. chapter one, big yep. one. Yep. Yep. He says that Drota sees the men carrying pikes. He then he talks about how incorruptible his memory is, and then he says that he sees Rosha. That Rosha says he sees men carrying pikes. Right. Right. There's you know there's still the theory out there. This is a typo, and if so, you know, Wolf had the world's worst editors because yep. it happens on the first page. Yep. It can it continues to persist across every edition and translation. It just it. For 40 years. So I've never bought that. But, you know, this does resolve that. Yep. Severian remembers has two memories in yep. his mind. Yep. It suddenly it makes sense. Triskily, once again, he, he resurrects Triskily. He finds the atrium time. There's a reason for that. The, the, the chapter finally makes sense to me. The old autarch says that he was his mentor, uh, Payon, uh, came to him. He was like 50 years earlier, he was his mentor and he told him about Severian. So was the old, uh, was the old Autarch's mentor, Payan, was he was the first Severian? How deep down the rabbit hole are we going? <laughs> no, I don't think he's the first Severian. But wait, I want to get back to Craig. Craig, did did, did we answer or, or make any progress for your question about Gamal Rubius and Triskelli? Autarch? Oh, it certainly opens up the idea that they could be from him somehow. And in fact, honestly, I mean, one thing about this theory that is open to a lot of questions is sort of when you get into the mechanics, like we keep talking about, okay, the Uh the first Severian manipulated things so that blah, blah, blah. And yeah, we don't certainly get tons and details of about, you know, exactly how he would do that. But when you point out about the ship, you know, at least that gives some kind of, oh, connection to, um, you know, at least a possibility that at least the ship is around and perhaps, you know, first Severian could be on the ship <laughs> moving around, you know, <laughs> I mean, that was the only other thing I thought about that. Otherwise though. Um, yeah. I mean, because those two have to come from somewhere. And I think I had always assumed that they're sent by the, once you know what the high duels are and what their plan is that they're sent by some version or, or something from the Asadis. But in wow. this case, it could be, like that to me would be the big question. Are they actually sent by the Yasadis? Is there still some sort of Yasad thing trying to work Severian into being Autark or is, are they from first Severian? Um, and that opens up one bigger question about this is that are there, when you had mentioned before, when you first started, you know, are there competing factions in time doing things that we could think about, you know, are the, the Abaya monsters fighting some war to keep this from happening behind the scenes. I don't know that, that part, I just don't have much evidence, but it does the Malrubius folk just make me wonder, are they from something else from, from something in Yassad that's also still going behind the scenes that would be, make it 
even more complicated. Whereas one thing I really like about the first Severian theory is that it actually simplifies a whole lot of things <laughs> about what's going on behind the scenes mm -hmm. and makes it clear and answers a whole yeah. bunch of questions. But It's tricky in part because Wolf seems to consistently play both sides of the, there are real ghosts and there really are technological ghosts and you can't really tell the difference between them and why would you want to yeah. anyway kind of a thing. I mean, he, he's really, he's really doing that. So if we, if we take him at the first time and say, well, you know, Severian nearly drowning is having a psychological, this is just a purely psychological thing where he sees his old master and then the Aquasters uh, and Eidolons and all that are all just technological ghosts. But then you say, oh, right, well, how would they know to use that man and that dog? And it's like, well, how would they know when they were, like like uh, James was saying, when the old Autarch was visited by his old master, how did they know to do that? Well, I mean, it could be a real ghost uh, or it could be just another one of these technological ghosts and the distinction between the two just kind of wears out. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, okay. I have a question. I okay. wanna, it's a little, it's a rabbit hole. I want to run down it. That is actually touches on this. All right. And you're not even going to see it coming. Uh -oh. All right. Okay. So let's talk about Thea. This is big to me. And I, I know it's the, I'm the only person that has been as bothered by Thea since, since this book was written and she's always bothered me. And I've talked about this on this podcast. Severian is in, is in love with Thecla, but he's really turned on by Thea and he's most turned on by Thecla when she looks the most like Thea. All right. So thematically Thecla is the claw. Thecla, the claw. She's the indwelling Holy Spirit, as the spinet on Christ at his baptism in the form of a dove. So, why is Thea the one who is constantly associated with doves? This makes no sense. The doves reference, I have tried so many ways around to try and figure out what it is with Thea and doves. I said, well, you know, okay. Um, Aphrodite is associated with doves. No, nope, th th that's a dead end. I got nowhere with that. It's, it just didn't make any sense. However, I think I know the answer now. Uh Oh, you see the first, for the first Severian, it was Thea who was in the Madachin cell. She was captured for being a votalist follower. Maybe she was captured, you know, out in the jungle or maybe she was sending letters at the time you know, and captured at, how, at, at, at House Absolute. It doesn't matter too much. But it was Thea who was excruciated on the revolutionary. It was Thea that the first Severian fell in love with. It was Thea who the first Severian shows mercy on by letting her kill herself. She's the reason the first Severian was exiled. The first Severian changes things. So that Thea, whom he loves as much as Second Severian loves Thecla, so that Thea could escape. Uh, perhaps he works things so that she would actually run away with Votilus in time to get out of house, absolute. But this theory kind of resolves all the weirdness about Thea. I don't know. I don't know. It. It. I think it. It might be better to just resolve it as saying that that Thea is kind of like the false Thecla. And, and even though he sees her first, just like the false coin he gets that he thinks is authentic, it gives him a sense of what the th real thing is like. But then later when he sees the real thing, you see what I mean? He, yeah. when he, and now we don't know, we've already been messing with the timeline for the first Severian, so we don't know when the first Severian met Thea, if he ever did, but... But just, just going by what we have for the second Severian, it's a very dramatic time when he sees Thea. And I, I, we can't, I don't think we can strip away her role. She's, she's the dashing adventurous beside the dashing 
the swashbuckling vocalist, right? Yeah, I mean, it's she's a lot deep, but it goes a lot deeper than that. Well, he I'm just I'm just the, saying that that's he first sees them. It's it's and he he swears allegiance to the rebellion and everything. I mean, it's like it's this huge package that she is a part of, and you know, she in in so many ways she's the opposite of Thecla because she's free for one thing. She's out there running around doing all this stuff. And, you know, she's got this this hot boyfriend that everybody <laughs> wants to emulate. And, you know, and she's probably going to be uh, at the the new, you know, queen of the land, the way things are going. But, yeah, but but after he he actually encounters her in the jungle, he, he there's no evidence that he ever even thinks about her anymore. Well, right, because, but that's, again, that's the thing is that by then he's kind of, um, he's woken up to it. He realizes how how ditzy and and she's she's just a mess really and um the the illusion has finally fallen away well he also comes to to see the rebel leader in a totally new light because he turns out to be a, a real douchebag na- yeah. nasty guy so so yeah it's a it's a long falling off but just to say we normally we're i think we're doing conservation of of characters such that they they will do their same role it's just, well, I agree, but also we are dealing with with literary and and mental illusions in Severian that simply make no no clear sense, and we have to make those work too. And and Severian's relationship with Thea is just a little weird; it's a little bizarre. And something else that the reason I don't think that Asia and Hathor were a couple. In, for the first Severian, is his reaction to Aja when he sees her. He's attracted by her. He doesn't know why he's attracted by her. He's strangely attracted by her. I'm not sure what the relationship with Aja and the first Severian was, but I think it must have been sexual. Absolutely. I agree. That's why I say that they're like Bonnie and Clyde. Although maybe Bonnie and Clyde is not a good example because maybe they didn't really, you know... <laughs> But if there's any woman, well, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I think they must have been. I, it, they, I think that they must have been an item. That first Severian and Nausea must have been an item, because that is the only way to explain something that even second Th- Severian never really fully understands, and that's his attraction to Asia. Right. And I, I see the same thing going on with Thecla. Even he doesn't understand. Everyone else can see it. He goes to the house Azure and when uh, the false Theo goes by, false Thecla says, oh, see, I know what you're really interested in. I don't know what you're talking about. I saw it. And then he comes, when he comes to to Thecla in her cell, he's, she's got her hair up in a bun and he says that she looks so much like Thea. And I thought that I, my heart was pounding so bad. I thought my blood was going to fall out on the floor. And this suddenly resolves for me, something I've always had a problem with. And I admit I seem to be the only person on the entire planet that has bothered me. I found that I, but from my first reading with a Thea, I first found it all very strange. And by following this thread, I ha- I've explained something else. I'm going to go ahead and, and construct this, a new theory based on the first Severian theory and with the understanding that it solves the, my theory, my Thea problem. So we were puzzling over Severian's vision while he's drowning. Malrubius is looking for him, but he can't find him because he's down in the examination room tied to a table and he hears a woman crying. So the question is, is this a vision, a delusion, a memory? Does Severian drown? I propose that Juturna saves him, just as the text says that she saves him. But what he's remembering down there is Thea inside First Severian. And that is her excruciation that he's remembering. And if we accept this, then why is Malrubius looking for her? And why is there an equester of, Mal- of Master Malrubius and Triskali, a man from Severian's childhood, whose death, strangely, he does not very clearly remember. He can't remember exactly when it occurred. 
and a dog that he never really got a chance to, you know, have. So what is the possibility that Master Malrubius didn't even die in Severian's uh, memory, that he remembers him dying or apparently dying in his life, but not in another, because there was no Master Malrubius in his in the first Severian's life, because Master Malrubius is the first Severian. And think about this. This is how this solves the question of why Master Malrubius and Triscally. Why what happens to Triscally? Severian adopts him. So now we have Master Malrubius and Triscally running around, crossing time. And so the Equaster is of the first Severian and Triscally. And that explains why they're there. Have I confused matters for you or or made anything more simpler? Well, they say that the aquasters are always made of those who are already dead. So But we have but first of Arian we've seen his grave. I don't know. And that's interesting. We don't actually see Triscally die. But, yeah, um, that that's the thing. We don't. In fact, there's really no hint of it other than he shows up as a an aquaster, and then they say, yeah, we only use those who've passed away. So then it's like, oh, well, I didn't even know he was sick, you know? Right. As opposed to Malrubius, yeah, yeah, he, he died a long time ago. And all the other boys, they always use, you know, what will Malrubius, oh, you know, He'll catch us, or what will he say, right. or that kind of thing. He lives well, on. Well, yeah, and, and so in Second Severian, there was a, a Malrubius, but not for First Severian. But that explains why Master Malrubius is so fuzzy in Severian's mind. Sometimes he doesn't even remember that he that he had died, and when he does think back, he says, "Well, you know, he he. I'm not sure exactly when it was. It must have been. It must have been when I was very young." Well, I can certainly see if we're if we're going along with the idea that Triskelly was is a is a manipulation that did not exist at all for the first Severian, then the fact that he shows up as an aquaster, then who does he always show up with this other guy? So then maybe there's some manipulation. That seems to be what you're saying. There's some yeah. manipulation with Malrubius that puts him in the same category of these are your spiritual guides that mm -hmm. we're going to use that didn't really exist for the first one, but you need them because you're heading into these weird territories. So, right. What do you the, what do you think, Craig? Does that solve the weird strangeness of the Equasters? I'm you? still thinking on it. I mean, I feel like I've got it. Well, no, I just feel like I've got to figure out a few other bigger things about who might be sending them first and get that clear before. Craig, that's an important point because if, for example, if we, you know, the night uh, that Severian spends in, in the bed with Baldy and then people think, oh, there was a screw up at, at Dream Central and the, the, the beam, the beam that was supposed to go into Baldy's head went into Severian's head and the beam that was supposed to go in Severian's head went into Baldi's head. That is, they, there's a the kind of idea that their dreams were kind of mixed up because of some some screw up back at the central or something. And so then the idea is, oh, well, are they trying to like you say, which faction is this? Is this is this the the Megatherian faction trying to seduce Severian, or are they trying to send a a semi-coded message to Baldi and it and there's this screw up. I mean, you know, so so trying to determine what is the source of this particular thing, <laughs> like which faction is sending it, let alone what does the thing itself mean? Yeah, that's that's a huge that's a huge question. Yeah, that's one thing that this this theory does not straighten out is for instance, Jaterna's loyalties and motives. It doesn't resolve whatever you consider strange about the autar the old Artark is it, still strange. Um, whatever's mysterious about Severian's mother is still mysterious. 
So, uh, oh, here's something else that, that, that this doesn't resolve, but kind of opens up. Because I believe that Thea was the original, she was the one in the cell for the first of Aaron, because I believe that. Then it just makes the issue of Thecla's scent burning rose even more annoying to me. But see, that's it's. But that's the same. That's why your your annoyances are of the same category. Of yes. That, that the things things that should link to this are applied to that, and it makes you get kind of antsy. I, I, <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. But let's just recognize that this this is this is exactly it. Because you're like, wait. How can that, which that obviously relates to this other girl over here that has nothing to do with the, the, the other, these half sisters over there. Exactly right. It, it's a, uh, I hear you. Yeah. Well, I feel, well, they, I feel like I have an answer though for the, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't feel like I have an answer for necessarily for, for Catherine other than, other than that. And this is, a, I guess this was, was Clute's. Um, a theory from way back that Catherine didn't run away from the Pellerines. She ran away from the Kaibits. That was the monial order, the monial order that she ran away from. And because we know that she didn't run away from the Pellerines, because for the first Severian, his mother could not have run away from the Pellerines. And it never made sense to me that, that the running away from the Pellerines would result in being arrested and sent to the Manichean Tower. They don't, the Pellerines don't even abuse slaves who malinger or run away. They just sell them. So that never made sense. So, but if someone ran away from the Kaibets, from the House Absolute, well, yeah, that could be technically seen as treason. And so you might be arrested and sent to the Manichean. And if you believe that, then suddenly you have all these potential connections between Catherine and Thecla yep. and Thea. Because Catherine is obviously, she's the one character that is associated with roses. One thing I think, just to make sure that, that you know, for everyone listening, that because we are kind of, we're starting off with a rabbit hole with this one a bit, of a bit and, and going deeper. So let's go back to <laughs> one other thing that I think really this addresses really well. We mentioned it a couple times, but but Severian's memory. I mean, you asked, you know, do you think that both of them have eidetic memories? But I think that the other thing this does is very clearly suggests that part of the reason why Severian has such a good memory is because he's somehow able to be in touch with his other memory at the same time. And mm. that that could potentially be one reason why he's constantly getting lost in his memory is not just because he has such a good memory that it's almost as strong as a hallucination, but it could also be a byproduct of, you know, himself being alive twice in this, in this world. That's just right. a totally different take on his memory that I don't think many people have talked about um, as an option, but that's one thing that's there. It also, of course, does pretty clearly, I feel like explain a lot of those sort of obvious gaps right? Like you mentioned, like the, 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 mm -hmm. the Drodden and yeah, Roach well, thing, like true. one thing sure. this does is it kind of finally gives a reason for him to do that. One thing we've always wondered is why would he get that wrong or why would he lie about it or why would Wolf allow it to stay in there? Mm -hmm. And what this does is it's sort of from the beginning, a tiny little clue that then when you get to the end might be, and you find out, he says, you know, there was a first Severian, it kind of points out maybe right. he does have he is intentionally sort of mixing up his memories from from different times that that could be i mean it's still feels still it's a it is still right. a bit yeah. of a stretch i feel like but it at least is it makes more sense than anything else does about why he would mix up the names at the beginning well i think he must have eidetic memory and this is why and this is really the only reason why because when he ingests Thecla, it is different from yes. him yes. than it is for everyone else. For everyone else, the memory fades. But for him, it persists. So much so that he does become androgynous. He, people see him at times as a woman. And maybe they see them all the time from that point on as being androgynous. And they simply don't mention it. So in that way, I think he must have an eidetic memory. And if he had an eidetic memory, then the first Severian had an eidetic yeah. memory. He had the yeah. same issue. 
Right, right, right. But the second Severian has the claw. The first Severian did not have the claw. And so when we say that the reason why it's, it's the claw that actually makes the, the Thecla thing um, quite different. And, and that's a slow developing picture for Severian because at first he kind of thinks it's just his memory, like you say, but then mm -hmm. as he's understanding more and he realizes. It was the claw, yeah. And that's, I think the, the nurse, the, the nurse in the Lazarus the actually doesn't, she specifically says that, right? When she's humoring him with his theory or something it, is that where it happens but it's somewhere in the book it that's presented as exactly what happened that maybe or, or there, severian's thinking about something and, he's, and he says oh yeah maybe she was reborn in me because of the claw um but he brings that up as a possibility too yep so. but the claw the, the claw isn't anything the claw is just a thorn in fact, when the when BFNO examine it, they say uh, this is very nice, but there's no way it could have done any of the things that you say that it did. And, and he's that's basically the same thing that the Pellerine tells him. This is this is nothing. This is not. She's of course she doesn't believe it's even the claw, but we get confirmation that it's just the thorn. Well, right, right, right. Which is ultimately ultimately it's the first Severian working through it, but 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 we're still just saying the distinction between. The right. first and the second Severian is that the first one doesn't have uh, things being um, like reanimated around him. And stuff yeah, like and I, I think it's still a question, right? I mean, I'm not sure that that's that's exactly, but it does make sense that yeah. you know, if with this theory, that part of the reason why she does come back to life inside of him could be due to first Severian and not necessarily just because of his memory. Now, I don't know. I mean, so do we then say that? What about but? Don't we agree that the first Severian, if not Thea, then, then Thecla, that he thematically, theologically, don't they both have to have the Holy Spirit? Because that being for a... Right. And that's why I, that's why I prefer it to be Thecla. Yeah. But I'm yeah. also saying that, but I'm saying that for the first Severian who didn't have the resurrection power, it was... It was not quite the high definition Thecla. It was more like Thecla on a VHS tape kind of Thecla. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, no, okay. But but again, these are all these are yeah. paradoxes. I mean, it's yeah. it's a huge. Yeah, we are still spe thing. stacking speculations on top right. of each other. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I have definitely stacked. A, I, I have a jenga going on of speculation. I get that, <laughs> but, but, but literally, all of the speculation you see, I didn't plan it out. I just kind of followed <laughs> followed a thread along. I know it seems hard to to imagine that <laughs> because that how well how do you how do you get these bizarro things all to to stack together? And I'm, I'm not playing them out. They, I'm just following along where it's going. Which brings me, Hathor. I I never understood this, and it's not even clear to me why this theory changed things for me. I do agree. I I think that there is a there must be a Severian backstory, a first Severian backstory for Baldanders, Asia, and Hathor. But Hathor is a really strange one. What's his game? What's he about? Don't bother checking his saint's name. He's a nobody. He's just one of 90 Angle priests killed by Vikings in the ninth century. His name's etymology, non-starter. But Hathor has access to the corridors of time, right? Mm, I don't Not think mirrors. So. Not mirrors. He doesn't have, he's not obviously not going to the house absolute to Father Aniri's mirrors, mirrors. He doesn't have a spaceship. He has he has sailcloth from Zadkiel's ship. Well, that's how he does it. And so he was at the battle, and he got scraps, and he knows he knows how to how to do it. And so that's the answer. When Severian says, "How can the guy have all these pets? He'd have to have this huge cart just to move them all around." Mm -hmm. He summons them. He's a sorcerer. He summons them through the mirrors. He uses the mirror magic. And remember, when when Severian is talking about the the mirrors at the House Absolute, he even says that these 
the mirrors on the ground, these are like toys compared to the real mirrors. Mm -hmm. And even with the toys, they can summon the fish and all that stuff. And even with that toy, Jonas can be, you know, disintegrated. Mm -hmm. But now you've got this old sailor who has some name. He's it's some ancient name. He's not going to tell you. Mm -hmm. And he's got scraps of mirror that can be folded up. You'd never find them on him. And uh, he knows how to use them to summon all these different monsters. So he, he's the one who his, summons, but what's summons his the flying beasts, right? Yeah. Do we agree that do we do we actually agree that he's trying to kill Severian? Do we actually know that? He's doing whatever the hot girl wants him to do. <laughs> oh, well, I'm not I'm not convinced I, I'm not actually convinced. I think maybe their relationship might be the other way. But something that I've noticed about Hathor is that he basically shows up at key moments. And rescues Severian. Like when he's in Thrax, Severian has to escape from the Archon. What happens? Oh, here comes Hathor with his uh, salamander and he's distracting all of the guards. So Severian not only has time to escape th uh, Thrax, but he also has time to go in and heal the kids and then go back and talk to Dorcas before she leaves. And then another event, he's with the magician and he's struggling with the magician. He's fighting. Maybe he's going to lose. And suddenly here comes Hathor with his big blob and takes out the magician. Yeah, but that's, see, all these cases, though, are just, they're just kind of funny, aren't they? I mean, also uh, in the antechamber, right? He gets thrown into the antechamber and then suddenly the slimy thing is hunting around. In other words, yeah. wherever he ends up, he always uses, he's like, he sees a chance, a shot on goal. He takes it and manages to miss. It, it just, um, something screws up. He's trying to take him out. He's trying to take him out. I have an understanding of Hathor's name. Hathor the Thorn. He at the front <laughs> and at the end. It's his job to move Severian along. Hmm, could be, could be. And also something, by the way, that also frustrates me, by the way, he's at when we first introduce him, he's looking for what his sex doll or something with hands like doves. Ugh. So anyway, as I said, this not all theories are resolved by this. <laughs> One interesting question I feel like you could ask here is, is Earth of the New Sun how because everything we've been talking about so far really focuses mostly on the four books of the new sun but in earth anyone happen to remember anything where we might see something about that first severian again because we it seems like if that was part of it then maybe he should show up again somewhere at least especially since we're kind of getting second severian doing some of the things there that first severian does like and I don't yeah. know if it's just because it's not as fresh or if it's just not there, but it, it, this seems to do so, so much for new sun, but I don't know where that idea would show up explicitly. If it really even does. The passing of the test, it always struck me as a little peculiar because doesn't he, when he passes the test, don't they say, Oh, you've already passed the test. Yep. And uh, so I think right. in that sense, yeah, we have, that uh, could be one. Yeah. We have, demonstrated a, that right. first of has already done it well no well kind of but they're they're also they're just so manipulative they they say and the earth will be destroyed as per your order and then all the sailors <laughs> flip out because yeah and it's a total surprise for him too so uh -huh. so you know but not exactly but not not second severian's order is it but right, they're just they're just making but... stuff up. It seems like they're just making stuff no, up. Oh, do you think so? I, I think that they're they're referring to the first Severian. Well, that's yeah, that that's also there you go. There's a gap there too. You're right. You're right. That's a definitely a possibility. And I think that that the Earth of the New Sun, I think Wolf expected people after a few readings to pick up on this whole first Severian, second Severian. 
But the reason they didn't is that they knew about Earth of the New Sun coming out. They thought that all of this was going to be explained. Ah. And it threw them off. And Earth of the New Sun takes this 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 unified cyclical it's not even a story. It's 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 like a it's like a thing that all fits together. It's like a Chinese puzzle and that doesn't really pull apart in any particular way and you can't figure out how it fi- how they even fit it together. And it moves it off into a unidirectional timeline, moves it into the future. And I think it threw people off for that reason. Because everyone thought that things were being explained that weren't being explained. They saw Severian rather than being manipulated by a past version of himself, they saw him manipulating the past himself. And it made them say, oh, okay, so it's Severian. It's this Severian that we've come to know in this story who goes off and creates the conciliator. No, no, I don't think so. And in in fact, it's entirely possible that this Severian is going to go and manipulate his own timeline. Well, I think just to what you're saying is that, right, in Earth of the New Sun, Severian transitions from being the more passive one Mm -hmm. into being something like the first Severian. He is being more active. And so he's kind of leaving this weird kind of still life world. Exactly. That's a perfect word for it. And now now things are just coming at him and he thought he had a grip. He thought, okay, I'm going to be a mausoleum builder. I'm going to end <laughs> up back in the dawn of right. time. He doesn't seem to have any clue whatsoever that he was going to be the conciliator. And so that is such a huge loop right there. Right. And um, you keep you keep spicing it up by even though <laughs> everything seems kind of laid out and you know, you know, this, but then it goes like that. And then again, the big surprise that the coming of the new sun is going to flood and destroy the planet after all this work and effort it's right. it's really it's really something so so then he he runs into the past as far as he can it's kind of a again an animal panic reaction he ends up kind of catapulting himself beyond the reach of his power source and so he ends up being stranded back there because some sort of inertia Momentum time, related to right, time, time travel, time momentum, yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, he, so he never haven't seen him do the mausoleums yet. So it's like got all sorts of. <laughs> well, we just assume that he will. I mean, but once you've gone this far into the new Severian, there's no telling what he'll do. Really, once again, it's not deterministic. Right, right. But it seems to be. It seems to be a trending an improvement in a positive direction kind of a thing. Yes. Grant, granted, the horrific nature of the, <laughs> the end result is still the same. I mean, well, let's go back to the passage from Citadel because there he says, we just talked about that when he says, I now know the identity of the man called the head of day. Well, that's because he figured out it was him himself. Um, but then why Hildegren mm-hmm. here was too near perished. And James, you had said you had an idea about that one. But then he, because he has the rest of that sentence is I... I uh, knew why Hildegren, who was too near, perished when we met, and why the witches fled. Yeah, which is really that's that's a lot of promise right there because the witches are in, their motives are inscrutable, and so if someone could come up with a reason for why they did anything, that would be a blessing. But so okay, we know that that Hildegren is killed. We know that he's killed because what? Because Severian meets his equester or his his. Other self, I guess the Equaster moves on. This is his his other self. This is the first Severian, and they there's an explosion or something, and he's killed. And why the witches? Is there is there some sort of motivation in all that that's being revealed that I'm missing? I guess it all sounds like plot mechanics to me rather than motivations. I think well, the reason for the explosion is because the they're still in the time frame of the second Severian. Uh-huh. And so it, it's like, that seems to be the rule that they explain is that if the two 
the, the one who's in his natural time frame will have more strength than the one who's been drawn from another time mm-hmm. frame is the way they explain that, which then seems to be another reason why supposedly you shouldn't have two Severians from different time frames <laughs> in the same right. room, which is why the, you have all that tension at the end of the Earth is the new sun. And it also might go towards explaining why first Severian doesn't just show up in person and talk with young yes. second Severian. Right. Because right. you have this some kind of a physics problem or something. Well, what about why the witches flee? Why did the witches flee? Yeah, I, I I don't have much answer to that, although it it sounds like like we were saying before in email, I think that that was the closest assassination attempt <laughs> by the megafarians. They thought, well, we're just going to we're going to do an ah. end run around all this. We're going to go back and and, uh, and strike wink wink them both out. Yeah, yeah. That that would have actually worked. That would have been interesting. Right. And so the witches are horribly embarrassed that they were so manipulated into this attempted hit. Oh. And plus the alien, she doesn't even she's not even really a witch. She's like, I don't even know why I'm hanging out with these people. I mean, it's all everybody just kind of scatters because the whole thing just goes so bad. The one thing that I do think is really cool about that scene right at the end of Claw is that uh, Wolf, if I'm if I read it correctly, Wolf does one of those things where the narrator keeps narrating, but we've actually switched identities for a moment because he talks about suddenly I should pull it out to read. But the way he describes it, as I recall, is that Hildegren runs down and grabs um, Apple Punchow. And then something happens. And next second, he says, and then Hildegren was holding me. Um, and Hildegard's got his arm around my neck. Uh-huh. Um, oh, similar to yeah. the kind of thing yeah. when he's yeah. when yeah. Uh, when in Earth when he's fighting. Um, oh shoot, the the armor robot. Uh, what's his name? But he's fighting, and and that his uh-huh. consciousness gets mixed up with his every now and then. Like you know when they're fighting, that he's fighting mm. myself, and my left arm was doing this and whatnot. But it's because he's sort of passing back and forth between the robot and himself. But the same thing kind of happens at that moment where it's hard to tell exactly who they are but that's one thing that i thought was really cool is in that moment that's where you actually may for at least that split second have our severian become first severian for just a moment oh i just i'm I'm busy spinning theories (laughs) and of course that could just be part of the chaos and the craziness that happens because then things go nuts and no 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 well no i have uh i have something to talk about in what seven years or so <laughs> so <laughs> taking the long view because otherwise if you're just reading it for the first time it just kind of flat out doesn't make sense but then once you know that what's actually happening is his i mean yeah if i could find it i tried to push the the bandy legged man away but one of their random blows caught me by the side of my head and knocked me to my knees when i rose again so yeah, he's knocked down and sort of like hat loses consciousness for just a second when I rose again, I seemed to have lost sight of Apupunchau among the leaping, shrieking dancers. Instead, there were two Hildegrins, one who grappled with me, one who fought something invisible. Wildly, I threw off the first and tried to come to the aid of the second, which mm. is one of those moments where it could well be that, you know, we don't know which one he's describing. Wow. Well, what about what about the fact that Severian, the first Severian, didn't drown? Second Severian doesn't really understand that one, other than he feels like somebody has been working in his life all these times before. Michael, you had a a theory that the first Severian didn't drown in the water, that the drowning was a manipulation. Right. But I kind of get the idea from from this that first Severian doesn't think so. He thinks that the, the drowning did occur but how he was saved is kind of a mystery. There is a, a couple of possibilities that I've come up with. One is that the first Severian was not the first Severian, that there was a precursor Severian. And that, so that this cycle has been going on and that this, this second Severian is going to produce, you know, he's going to go back and tinker in his life. There'll be another Severian. So it, it, the cycle goes on. The other is there's a scene at the end of Earth of the New Sun where Severian is walking along at the bottom of the guile 
where the earth is flooded. And he's walking along the earth of he sees this skull, and he, and he muses about this skull of this child, that it could have been just like him. And he, you know, and for a lot of readers, me included, it felt like, oh, we're getting a hint that this was Severian, that this was Severian's skull, that he did drown. But what if, what if the original Severian did drown, but he was either created, an equester was created, or... Father Ineri saves him in some way. I just don't think so. I think that it was the drowning, the near drowning is a was a complication added by the first Severian to the second Severian. So it, it, it just just like the dog, it, it wasn't in the first one. Well, that is complicated because Severian says that the reason Juturna went back was first Severian encountered her and told her to go back. So what is the point of first Severian causing second Severian to drown? And then just in order to engage a savior for him. Well, right. I mean, the thing is that we, and again, that's part of how in Earth of the New Sun, he's being the more active one, um, which makes him start to seem more like what we're saying for the first Severian. Mm -hmm. And when he says to Juturna, well, you rescued me. And she says, well, I will now. And mm -hmm. it's like, well, wait, if you didn't before, then it, it all kind of paradoxes right there. Well, yeah, but not for the first Severian. I mean, that works for the, sec the second Severian. He realizes that this scene that he has with Juturna has happened before with the first Severian. He went, he said, You'll, you should go back and save me. And so she goes back to save him because he encounters her. But there must have been a drowning that the first Severian re remembers that leads her to go back initially and do that. I mean, that's the way it, these, you, once again, the, the, the theory that you're constructing here is kind of a, a movie time travel theory, like 12 Monkeys or something, where everything happens because it happened. But that's not the, the structure of this time travel that Wolf has created, right? There Originally, there was no conciliator. Then the first Severian went back. He did, goes through all the steps. He creates a conciliator. Now Severian grows up with a conciliator. By the same token, first Severian drowns, is in the water, but doesn't die. Or somehow he, he doesn't drown. He eventually encounters the Undyne in the House Absolute. She says, oh, well, I will go back and save you. Do you see how that's... It looks to me like a, a, a it looks to me like a troubling knotted ball of yarn there. Well, like I said, though, um, for, in this particular case, I'm saying that the the whole near drowning thing was actually engineered by the first Severian so that the second time ship could get a reading on what goes on in his head, and but they know he's not going to drown because it's the it's the first Severian, so it's not really a problem. But that, so you're saying that the first Severian, he didn't drown in the water at all. Right. And that he engineered it, that the drowning episode gives us the first glimpse of what will later become a model or a template for the Aquaster. Well, hey, we've come back to my Malrubius in that case. There but. you go. <laughs> and I think it's also important that the first Severian is trying to give that drowning experience to intimate the great flood that will come, you know. So. But that's, does that kind of undercut what Severian says at, at the end of Citadel, where he says, um, he says, uh, the undying thrust me up when it seemed that I must drown. Yet surely the first Severian did not. Something had already begun to reshape my life. So Severian seems to be saying that something well, right. In other words, peculiar happened in the life of the first Severian well, at that point, or or not. In other words, that thing didn't happen. In other words, it, it was a non-issue. It didn't. It simply didn't happen at all. That. But I hear what you're saying. It, it it it's paradoxical. There's no question about it. The thing is that I can see why the Undyne would want to help him out, even if she knows that he doesn't really need the help. She's just trying to to curry favor. Uh, hopefully when he's just still young and dumb or whatever. Um, <laughs> and she's 
I think she's she's doing this. She's traveling through time, so so even though this is the first time we see her in the text, yeah, she already knows. Yeah, and she'd already tried to to grab him up at the river with you know. But that's I think the understanding in that case is that when she tries to grab him at the river, that's 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 the first time they meet that from her perspective that's the first time they meet exactly that's i just wanted to establish that yeah exactly right so in other words she's she's already tried her other seductive techniques and whatnot and now it's just like oh all right you know okay i'm on board <laughs> i'm on i'm on team severian now there you go yeah i agree but i don't i, I feel like the the reading that severi the first severian didn't drown at all it just it, it forces me to just discard this little sentence, this little parenthetical sentence. Well, how about if we if we approach it another way and say that the drowning episode, it began because he had that up-down disorientation that he has <laughs> whenever magic starts to happen. If we say that that's what re- is really triggering or it's a, it's a side effect or a, something that a tell that mm-hmm. something unusual is happening is that he gets this up down confusion and so mm-hmm. then that's the manipulation that's a sign of of how the mechanics of how this is becoming an episode that didn't happen to the first one because there was nobody casting this disorientation spell upon him i see what you're saying i'm just satisfied <laughs> no i hear you it's paradoxes all the way down one stacked upon the other Yes, I've got my Jenga of theories going. So, well, that's it. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Michael. You are very welcome. And so, once again, we have come to the end of a long string of curiositus (laughs) earthus linked one to another, as far as the eye can see. And this one, I'm sure we're going to be referring to a lot. So that's one reason why I am glad we took some time to really go through it. Because, you know, as we pointed out, there are a lot of things that can get tied up here and possibly explained. It certainly does make more questions, but I feel like it also makes a lot of sense when you're trying to figure out both plot questions, but that really actually do fit the fit the themes and the points of what everything yeah. else is, is shooting for. And this goes a long way to doing that. So I'm, that's one reason why I'm really kind of excited about it. Oh, kind of foundational. I, I feel like, uh, you know, the guy that Michael went might meet at a party where he says, you know, well, you know, boy, the inflation is bad. Yeah, that's right. The fed is a, is all a plot. And by the, that, no, 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 <laughs> stop agreeing with me. I don't agree. <laughs> but that is the nature of the way it works. But that's what, that, that shows actually to me what a meaningful interpretation and that it's real and that you take, I can take this and that I can, I can have problems and, and solve them even though, you know, <laughs> other people don't even see that they were a problem. So that's <laughs> I, this is what I call a useful understanding of the text. Yeah, absolutely. And Michael, thank you so much for staying up late with us again. Oh, you're welcome. It, it's a joy and a pleasure. <laughs> okay, well, this is just a little... A coda. A little com- yeah, a little coda. For a conversation to talk about our conversation with Michael, because... I'm still not done talking about it. I am really, really excited about this. And we were saying that we do still have some questions about how bigger issues add up at the end, but maybe what would be good if, is if we kind of talk about certain things in these beginning chapters. I think that would be good <laughs> sort of to bring it back to where we are right now. When we first started, we both had kind of an idea of things that we wanted to do. And one of the things I wanted to understand was what the heck is going on. And I really feel like, wow, I did not expect this to happen. Certainly not this early. I I thought that when we got to this point, we would have a better understanding of all the pieces that you know, I feel often feel like I'm looking at a chessboard in this story and that Wolf has removed half the pieces and expects <laughs> me to make a move. And I feel like, no, I, I feel like I understand all the pieces that are on the board. And, oh, no, it's not a, such a big deal. The, it's not that the heroes and the Megatherians have some hidden agenda that we have to worry about. It's Severian over yeah. on the side. 
Yeah. And it actually makes a lot of the how would this happen stuff with the conspiracy that I've always felt in the early chapters. It clears things up a bit because what I mean is that when you're thinking about how the Hyros and Erebus and Abaya are trying to manipulate Severian, it just gets really complicated to know, well, how would they get down into sort of the details of his life? And maybe that's not a question that we have to really think about. But I, but I do, and especially because so much in these first chapters are kind of suggesting that Severian's being watched or that his life is already important, even though he has no idea why. And yes, the High Rose can look from the future to the past. But they're leaving because it's happened. Exactly. They weren't, they weren't expecting this from the beginning. He wasn't a plan from the beginning, but now that it's happened... They, they're moving back like tourists yeah. <laughs> and looking at all the important parts of this of history. Exactly. And so now to think of it as Severian being the one who's sort of coming back and reliving his life and setting it in certain directions, that makes more sense to me um, as a, as a way that just for, for how this stuff would work. Cause otherwise it just seems to be, I mean, Malrubius talks about the deus ex machina that, that comes in the end. Uh, uh -huh. in Citadel. And it just seems like otherwise it would just be like, oh yeah, they're super powerful. And so they can manipulate all kinds of things. But then that doesn't make sense with how, you know, Barbados and Ospego and Familia, the Familias have to like physically come and talk to Baldanders mm -hmm. and, and appear. It's like, if they have this kind of magic power to manipulate and watch Severian at every moment of his life, that's very different from how they work through representatives or something right. like that. And so it, it didn't really, it didn't ever really feel satisfying. But to think about Severian now wandering the, you know, the corridors of time and setting things up for himself, it works better. It's just, there's, it, he can be much more hands-on and I think he is. Well, I remember when we first talked about starting this, I think, you told me that you would like to know during this reading whether Severian is a good person. Mm -hmm. Have you had any insight into that? Um, yeah, because I think if you can think about someone who's able to relive their life, <laughs> you know, <laughs> then what you see is this one character who's lived through much of this already and is trying to make it better. And he's still living like second Severian is still actually living through all this, mm -hmm. but it's also first Severian trying to set things up so that he makes better decisions or, or ends up in a better place. So I think it's more satisfying for me because it doesn't just make us have to decide whether Severian's good or bad. It, it sort of actively shows him, literally from the beginning working on himself and trying to yeah. become better. And then it's not a, there's no sort of point where we have to do a magic character change or something. Right. Um, although I think that does happen with Thecla, <laughs> which is a little <laughs> bit magic um, when Thecla gets inside of right. him. But well, my opinion, you know, when we first started, you, you had, and you said, well, I would like to know if he's a good person. I said, you know, I don't think it really matters whether he's a good person or not. I don't think. And, and, I think, you know, it's, this is about a society. And my opinion on that has also evolved. You know, I thought that, that his growth, his personal growth was irrelevant. But now I don't believe that. Starting in Chapter 4, Severian begins talking about the claw of the conciliator as the most precious gem in the world. And, you know, I figured that Severian or Wolf was being ironic because Severian has already learned that as he writes this, that the claw is just an ordinary thorn. But now I have a slightly different opinion. I think the first Severian was a qualitatively different person mm -hmm. than the second Severian. I think he was a harder man. I think he was a crueler man. And I think the change in his personality is related to the object, the symbol of the claw. By carrying a symbol of divinity in the mundane, Severian has become a gentler person, a more, more divine person. I speculated whether second Severian repeats the cycle of the first Severian, going back to change time so that Thecla can escape and that they can be together. I do think that the first Severian did that 
between Thea and Thecla. But I think, I don't think Second Severian would do that. For example, you know, have the false Thecla arrested instead of Thecla. I think mm-hmm. he's a better man now. Yeah. I mean, when he comes back at the end, he talks about how, isn't it the only one, the only prisoner who he keeps in there is the woman who's insane and right. was abusing children. But otherwise, he even says, I didn't believe any of these people's story, but I still let mm-hmm. go. So if I got that right, I can't remember exactly. But yeah, I mean, I agree that it, it seems that first Severian probably, you know, obviously realized that in order to bring about the end that needed to be brought about, he would have to change himself. And so I think that that's actually, or let me ask, do you think that that was part of first Severian's intent? You know, is it, is it first Severian who makes sure that Severian gets the claw and has this reverence for it? I wonder if he planned it that way, but he does do it. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, how can you know that I'm going to do this and make myself a better person? But he does, he does go back in time. He becomes the conciliator and predicts the new son, which Mm -hmm. he, you know, is easily done. That doesn't require, doesn't require being an especially nice person. Right. But now the claw exists. And he allows Severian to use it and believe that it is performing all these miracles, even though it's, you know, it's not. And Severian, even though Severian wanders around confused very often about how is it, when does it work? Sometimes it doesn't work. I don't get it. But I mean, he does it. Mm -hmm. And I think there is an arc in that sense, because I think we are invited to imagine how the first Severian's life was different Mm -hmm. from the second Severian. So when I come to this now to the end, just to tabulate Severian's memory issues, fully understand that. Drot, Roche. uh, Yeah. Okay. In first Severian's life, one said it in second Severian's life. The other said it. He's not sure whether he met Vodalus the night before. He feels mm. like he's insane. Makes perfect sense. For the first Severian, he never met Vodalus at that time. I think he must have at some point. But not at that time. So, which And I think he does meet him at some point. And that's why Severian says, I've always been a Vodalari. And, you know, mm-hmm. for his vision is drowning. I feel like I understand that. I feel like that is his, his memory. He says he sees it, remembers himself on an examination table and a woman crying. Well, that's, that's Thea. If you want, if you don't believe that Thea was the first person in the cell, then Thecla, but it was that person. And that also leads me stacking speculation on top of speculation Mm -hmm. as one is invited to do. I say, since Malrubius is looking for him at that point, I say, well, that must be the first Severian. So I feel good about, the point is I feel really comfortable that I have an understanding of what's going on in those first two chapters. Um, Triskily, you know, this chapter that where he meets a dog and then he meets a girl and it's not supposed to mean anything, but it, strangely it does. You know, what happens to Triskily? Well, he's adopted by the first Severian. I really think that that's must be what happens. And why does Severian able to resurrect Triskily? Because for whatever reason, I think I know, <laughs> I think that Valeria is his sister, but he wants him to meet Valeria. Uh, Catherine, uh, Severian's mother, Catherine, her arrest and why, you know, I believe she was fleeing from the Kaibits as opposed to the Pelerines, because for the first Severian's life, there were no Pelerines. And then I believe that the autarchs androgynous nature is because he ingested Catherine, and all that explains for me his experiences after his elevation. And gosh, what else? I'm less sure that Catherine's body was the one that Vodalus and Thea dug up, but mm-hmm. I still like that. I get, you know, I say that that I believe Malrubius was the first Severian, but I'm not a hundred percent on that. But as I say, it makes it helps me explain a lot of things. I still detected connection between Catherine and Thecla and maybe Thea too. I don't know what that is, but my understanding that Catherine was a Kaibit opens the door to figuring that out. 
Uh, we're going to move into some strange waters after this. I I don't know oh, if yeah. we're going to be as successful at reaching a <laughs> point of satisf- satisfaction with this story that we have well, so far, in my mind. But I think there's still, I mean, I will say that I think in, in some of the details, I'm not quite as convinced that as far as what the details of the story are, mm-hmm. um, as you are, just because I... There's still places, you know, the way, especially the way you talk about Thea makes a lot of sense to me. It's just that there aren't as many, I don't know, just, just textual clues. Although you pointed out to the ones that, that do seem there and that seem like they're not really explained otherwise. Um, But that being said, there's still certain things about it that I feel like it makes a lot of sense in the big picture. Um, And I still have some questions about how it would actually work, about how much we're supposed to actually be able to figure out about First Severian's life. Mm -hmm. But then and the big question for me is more about what's the relationship between First Severian's quote unquote conspiracy to make all this happen and the High Rose quote unquote conspiracy to make all that happen, because I'm still not sure about that. And that has to do with Malrubius too, how, who Malrubius and Triskley are or mm-hmm. who they work for, or, or, I mean, not who they are. They, he tells us who they are, but who they're from, whose equesters they are. He says they came from you, but you know, it, it could well have been another Severian. Yeah, exactly. Severian. So, yeah. So I've still got some questions about it, but what I like is that it just makes so much more sense out of the passage where he describes the first Severian. And it's so hard for me to imagine that I read that and read that and I didn't come to this conclusion. But I assume because I was thinking of time travel the way we generally think of time travel. We don't think of time travel as being something that someone actively changes without being changed. The, the an unmoved mover. That's kind of an interesting term. I think too, um, the way Severian tells the story in that passage and the way I've noticed, like I went back through the earth list and, and read when, when people would talk about this, they treat it more as like a, a consequence of, like even if they did think that there was if if this was let's let's say a severian who lived his life before, before quote unquote, not after this severian they'll mention it as you know well somebody else went back and changed like it was mm-hmm. was the the high rose who said oh that's how we get him to the throne so we need to go mess with this timeline like that's right. i think how how most people have described this rather than severian himself being the one who independent of the high rose decided, oh no, I'm going to go back and, right. and make my life work this way. Yeah. yeah, that's that's kind of what I think, how I always thought about it. And so I thought it just kept the high rows as the, the primary conspirators. But now we've got sort of, I think, two groups of conspirators who are both make a lot of sense in, mm-hmm. in the story. But the primary one is Severian himself, which, and yeah. I like the way it fit, works with the designation of the autark. He's not the guy who rules the Commonwealth. He's not the guy who rules the armies of the Commonwealth or the heroes or the new son. Yeah. He is the guy who rules himself. Yeah. So actually, Earth of the New Sun, I think, both makes this interesting and makes it really hard. It might be, I would <laughs> think that if the if you're looking for a place to show that First Severian and, and our Severian are actually different characters. If you're trying to get that idea disproved, I feel like Earth of the New Sun might be the place to look. But I think my big question would be then, okay, so we know in Earth of the New Sun that Severian goes on to live as Apu Punchao. Our Severian, our narrator Severian, goes on to live as Apu Punchao for quite a long time. And my thought, though, was that if it had been first Severian who did that, as he seems to say in uh, The End of Citadel, then wouldn't our Severian have had to have met first Severian, basically? Yeah. And so that's... No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was going to say, James, James has a note, but that to me is like the, the first major point, because in Citadel, most of the things that are set up then as happening in the past, like everything that happens in Earth, are things that a different Severian did. But mm-hmm. now we're getting a narration of our Severian doing those things, becoming Apu Punchao, becoming the conciliator, all of that. Right. That's where if we're if we're doing a, a sort of a high school essay, this is the place where you present the counter argument and then rebut it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So 
Okay, first thing that you have to understand, I think, that we should talk about is what happens when the second Severian shows up in Yesod. Because the first Severian has already gone and taken the test. Obviously, he's brought the new son because he has to he has to be able to follow the, the corridors of time. And he gets that powers from the, the new son, right? Mm-hmm. So he's obviously passed the test, according to this theory. So what happens when he goes back, he tinkers with his own timeline, and then the new Severian, the one who's grown up in a culture of the conciliator, who's grown up with the symbol of the claw, and now he's he has also become Autark, and he goes to Yesod. What happens then? Well, the Yesodis have a problem because... There is no need for a test. The test has already been passed, but this Severian still has to go through the motions so that his timeline doesn't become improbable. Right. And and one thing just to point out here that, and again, we're, we are deep in the weeds here, but just, just to sort of say <laughs> some of the things that we're having to suggest, there are points where in Earth of the New Sun, it's suggested that Yasad is completely outside of Briah time and independent of Briah time. Right. And so when we talk about this as Severian having to go through the motions, that's almost as if saying, well, it kind of is, but still something has happened already that is true in Yasad and now has to be repeated a little yes. bit, right? Yes. Okay. And in fact, I think that this helps explain why the test is so weird and bizarre. And you can't tell when it started or where, when it ended or when it happened, or if he already passed the test or how he passed the test. Right. And that's actually the part that I find most fascinating about this, that, yeah, exactly what you're saying, that, that the test is so weird that I wonder every time I read earth, I keep wondering what actually is the test. Right. This might help explains some of that strangeness exactly why it, it always seems so vague so and i think we get a little picture of what is going on and wolf has provided this for us and that is gunny and burgundafar is that am i pronouncing that right i think that's right that's how i yeah. do it yeah so gunny of course and and severian are a, a complicated item <laughs> through the first mm-hmm. half of the book and then after Severian, quote unquote, passes the test, he comes back, he meets Gunny and Gunny has encountered her younger self. Mm-hmm. She was going by the name Burgundafara, her original name. And Gunny says, well, you know, I've explained to my younger self here that I changed my name to Gunny, but I've always kind of regretted it. And so I've told her and now she's not going to do that. And she says, I remember now that when I was a young girl, I met you, Severian, and I always kind of aisled you. I was always in love with you. So I'm going to let you two, you know, get together and be an item. I'm going to go off and do my own thing. I'm going to, you know, try to recapture my youth or whatever. But this knowledge is not a loop, right? You assume, oh, 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 so because we've met Severian, because we're so used to these these unified timelines that we see in movies. So we say, oh, well, Severian met young Burgundafara, so therefore this is that event. No, no, that is not this event, because the Severian that Gunny met was the first Severian. In fact, she has a conversation. Were you the same person when you were younger that, that you are now? And he says, no, no, actually, I've changed twice. <laughs> but <laughs> actually, he wasn't the same person that she knew when she was young. He was somebody He was somebody different in a, in a much deeper way. And Gunny goes off. She's not overwritten. She doesn't change because she's told Burgunda Farah that she shouldn't change her name. Her name, she's still Gunny. She goes off and she lives a different life. And and there now are two, there is, there's also to put it this way, there's a first Gunny who is Gunny. And there's also now sort of a second Gunny who is Burgunda Farah who goes on to the rest and experience the rest of Earth. Right. And she does something different. There's there's no sense that she went off to war or earth with this severian. But but it's it's tricky because 
if you weren't paying attention to that last paragraph in Citadel of the Autark, then you might say, oh, okay, I this is the, the whole unified timeline thing and it's a little timey-wimey, but it doesn't really work that way. It only works if you understand that this is a world where it's the corridors of time, not the corridor of time. There are many alternate futures and many alternate paths, pasts. Pasts, paths, but also pasts. Yeah. yeah. So in, in that section, in the scene with Gunny, one of the first things when Severian sees the two of them that he does is he brings up, hey, there was a time back basically at the end of Claw of the Conciliator where I think I ran into myself. Mm -hmm. And he says, once I, you know, he's got his scars healed now from coming through the the white hole, um, becoming linked to the new sun. And he says, the face I see now, unscarred and 10 years older, is the same face I saw on this Apu Punchow guy. But back then, this awful thing happened that there was some kind of weird little explosion mm -hmm. and my friend was doubled but also killed. And is that going to happen to us? It's like he brings this up and he tells a long story, but almost kind of like the Sith. <laughs> it's almost like saying, you two get away from each other or you're going to explode. But let me tell you a really long story about why you might explode. <laughs> yeah. But they bring it up as it to say, OK, well, that's what would happen if you basically... If they met somewhere besides Yesod. Besides Yesod, yeah. If they met in Bria. Right. Or at least if, if they were too close or too much of the same person to... Wait, yes. Yeah. yeah. But then they say that they can meet each other because they're in Yesod right now. And so the, exactly. the rules for all of this are broken, basically, by being in between exactly. the worlds. So that also does mean then, I feel like when Wolf specifically brings that up, it's almost it's very much a nod to say, Hey, look, there's a way to think about this, which is a sort of closed time loop that will, yeah. The, the, the sort of big cultural touchstone we have for that is back to the future, right? Where, you know, if you mm -hmm. mess up something in the past, it's going to overwrite, overwrite you and totally change you. Whereas we don't live in a world that's like that. Apparently. Right. Exactly. Um, or, or at least, well, sorry, whoa, we don't actually live in New Sun world. I shouldn't forget that. Every now and then, but, <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, but, um, but no, so in New Sun, it's all, that section specifically seems to say, no, the rules are weirder. Right. And, and in fact, there's certain times when there may not be specific, clear rules to how this time travel stuff works. So I feel like that's a specific way for him to say, like, things that might seem like a paradox are not. And, and it may just be arbitrary for the way that he's he's talking about physics here. I mean, none of us really know the actual laws of Yasadi physics and how they relate to Briya. So so let's talk about the um, head of the day. Right. The, the uh, Apu Punchau. So he doesn't encounter the first Severian in that stone tomb for the same reason he never met another Severian at the Madison Tower because it's not a unified timeline, just like there are alternate paths in the future, there are alternate paths in the past. And so the first Severian goes through and he gets trapped, you know, in the, in the stone village and he's laid to rest in that temple. And I, I assume the same sort of thing happens that the heroes come and they create an equester of him and he goes on from that point on. And then that equester goes off and starts tinkering with his own past. I, I assume that happens. That's when it happens. That's what it, that's how it would. Yeah. That seems I mean, to be the, the, the right. general outline of, yeah. How earth, how are the story? Of exactly. Goes. And he's, but, and then he comes through and he does the same thing. He ends up, in that same same stone village. Now, here's the he and the, but 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 before that, he he of course, uh, the witches resurrect that that village, and Severian ends up meeting the first Severian as Apu Punchau. So, but so he's going to come back, and now maybe, maybe that Equestor will go start tinkering with his own past. Now we don't know that he will. He might not, but if he did then it's possible that this additional new timeline of Severian could go through the same steps. He could be, he could meet Jalinta uh, and try to save her. And she'll, you know, by the, by the same processes, he would meet his, his other self again. 
But we don't know that that would ever happen. So all of this is to say that that I was thinking that Earth of the New Sun would be the biggest refutation to the first Severian theory. But actually, I don't think it is. That actually, in some of the ways that it talks about time travel, might actually leave the door open to helping us understand how it yeah, works. Yeah, I think so. We're still years away from years away from going through Earth in quite that detail. But I still feel like you know mentioning a few of those things. So, yeah, it just it's not a it's not an all or nothing game. That there's a lot of weirdness in there. Oh, yeah, I think there's I think that there are some some hat tips to what's going on. Uh, even though I think that just the writing of Earth might have led people astray on as far as what that last paragraph meant in, in the Citadel of the yeah. Autark. And I will say too, just because I think I've mentioned it before, but I'm still slightly concerned in my own. I just still have the suspicion that earth actually did do some different things mm. than that. He conceived of, and not just in like the character of Gunny or something like that, who obviously, you know, gets made up for a new book, but yeah, I'm just not quite sure that the same logic always applies, <laughs> but that's another question. I'll well, I'll bet the lot, I'll bet the time travel logic applies, but what about the Zadkiel? I mean, how much did he know about Zadkiel when he sees that picture at the uh, in right. the House Absolute? Did he know about a feta? Because he he mentions a feta, and I'll actually this is going to come up later, but I don't want to, and so I want to go into it deeply. But you know, he he mentions the same kind of feelings toward a feta that he has had for Asia, that he same sort of inexplicable desire. And uh, I think some of that might be explainable, probably is explainable through with understanding the, the first Severian. Yeah. But did he know? Did he know? That? Did he make that up? Yeah. I don't know. I'm not really sure. Well, good. Well, we're definitely going to get back into the actual chapters moving forward. We're going to probably refer to this a lot, of course, um, because it's it's. Yeah, James, you've decided it's your running theory. <laughs> I'm not. Yeah, I am no longer an analyst of this theory. I am an advocate, and it, the trick will be not driving people who are more skeptical crazy <laughs> with, <laughs> with references to this. And I mean, I think unless we unless we do drive ourselves crazy and notice it everywhere, I mean, I don't think it's something that you know. I don't think he's there all the time. When we get to Citadel, it's going to be a big deal. Mm -hmm. Also, I think that we're going to have a lot of opportunities to stop and consider how things might have been different for the first Severian and why it might matter. Mm -hmm. But I'll try to keep open to other <laughs> other ideas. And uh, I'll, I'll rely on listeners to come back with more expansive or alternative theories of what's going on to in order to keep me honest so we have to apologize oh who was it who on facebook said that all the time travel stuff makes him feel seasick oh shoot what, <laughs> oh no 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 that was uh, mike farrar uh said that our discussion of uh, i probably i assume it's mine but perhaps all of the curiosity earth this discussions that we did made him feel kind of seasick <laughs> coming out well, unfortunately, we've now got time travel even more firmly in the heart of what yeah. we're talking about. So, so we apologize for that. But we'll try to be good, and we'll try to, be, and we will be open to other theories. As and I'll try to stay distantly critical as well. So I'll still play the bad cop if I have. To. <laughs> I'm gonna feel like like Mulder talking to Scully after <laughs> she's seen werewolves and vampires, and she's every time. Well, I don't know. There's probably a natural <laughs> explanation for this. If you have a disagreement and you must with something that we've said here, uh, you can contact us on the Facebook group, Rereading Wolf. Or if you don't want to talk in front of everybody, you can contact us by email at rereadingwolf at gmail.com. We also have a subreddit, Rereading Wolf Podcast. We have an Instagram Go ahead and leave little short comments there on the Instagram if that's if that's your style, or uh, if you have something really short on uh, Twitter at Rereading Wolf. <laughs> Thank you for for spending this long period of time with us. 
to uh, discuss something that uh, we're going to talk about a lot. Yes, indeed. And I think we should probably stop it right there because we've been going on long enough and probably our most (laughs) self-indulgent episode that we've done so far. But thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time. I don't know where I came from or how I got this way. Mama say the sky lit up with lightning on my birthday. I've always been different. There's one thing that's for sure. I can still hear grandma saying Child, you've been here before Looking back, I wonder About all the things I've done No one seems to be sure Where I I came from I can still hear grandma praying and she'd be talking to the Lord she said child if I know one thing you've been here before at notes i'm looking at my notes but (laughs) you guys you guys here's your opportunity oh i see (laughs) craig you're up (laughs) shoot my hands on the sorry i've been on mute for a little bit because i got the hiccups for no good reason (laughs) Um. (laughs) well we could have used that for papers that would have been great